Hey guys, what's up? My name's Theo. I play middle linebacker for the Hilversum Hurricanes. I live in Amsterdam, both of those places in the Netherlands. I live in Europe. Yes, I'm American. We can talk about that another time. But I live here and I play American football in Europe. We are currently on summer break right now. Every Monday and Friday I put out football videos. This is a Monday video. Usually I'm going to practice the day before and I film most of the day or figure out what's going on and then I come home and I edit it. So we have practice on Sunday, video on Monday. Also, we have practice Thursday night, so I try to record a little bit there. Although in the beginning, I do do comment responses and news around the leagues of Europe or updates on my team, like what game we're going to be playing next or if we're having any complications. <laughs> um, so that's pretty much what's going on with that one. Um, we are currently on summer break, so we don't have practices on Sundays, just Thursday nights. So last week I did a little bit of strength training video, link up there. This week I'm gonna do a little bit of whiteboard stuff and I had a comment actually yesterday about something, so I'm gonna show that. It's very simple, actually. Uh, so we'll do that one at the end. There are chapters below down here. You can go to the various sections. They're also in the description. Okay, so today we're doing a whiteboard. It's not really gonna be diagramming like I would with the X's and the O's for linebacker stuff. But it's going to be, you know, so my USA folks can understand how the system here gets done in Europe and Europeans can see how it's done in the United States. Because I've actually been talking with someone in the gym who works there and he's a little confused about how things work. So that's why we have the other sides. So for now, you're going to see that coffee cup move around a lot. So currently here in Europe, as sports things go, there is, there are no school sports. There are. They're, they they have a gym, but it's really just to get physical education or to have kind of a break period where you want to just shoot some hoops or something or whatnot. But it's not, they have no organized teams. They do not have a Friday Night Lights. They don't have any of that because everything is built around clubs. Now, this isn't school clubs. This is athletic clubs. There are various other clubs for various other things, but like chess clubs and stuff. But they do not exist within the school system. They are outside, so Hilversum Hurricanes is an American sports club. They have baseball, softball, there's something called b-ball, which is for like kids, it has three bases instead of four, um, and I believe it involves a, a T, TB, um, whatever, it's that ball. And we also have American football. Some other clubs have like American football and they have rugby and they share a field. So, because they're eh, relatively okay, they both have uprights. Um, that's just the general thing with that one. So within your league, you, of your, t of your competition sport teams, whether it be, we'll take, talk this for Americans, whether you have soccer or ho field hockey or ice hockey or American football or rugby or all that jazz. You know, if you have a team sport, baseball, I, actually, I don't know how the baseball system here works, but, mm. so, but they have promotion and re and demotion systems. It's a, Promotion relegation, I think is what they call it here, but for American English, we use this because it's an up and down. In the USA, there are school sports. Club sports, they don't really exist in the United States. Um, in terms of American football, it's called semi-pro. There is a thing called amateur and club sports, but they, it's really strange. When you hear about like when I was living back in the States, a lot of people would talk about club soccer and stuff like that because the school, the high school for teenage years didn't have a soccer team. So you'd go out to an external group, get together and you would play soccer and you would play amongst teams and all that jazz. That says static league, my handwriting is atrocious. What this means is I'm gonna go into this one a little depth because this is where the Europeans get confused. This is in response to this. So, there are no school sports here. Schools have pretty much the domination of sports in the United States. Here they have clubs. The United States has semi-pro American football, but most everything else is an amateur club or people just sort of get together. And they are roughly the same thing. They're just named differently. This has a much more negative connotation in the United States because the United States is just weird. So if you, so that's why you don't play club American football, you play semi-pro because you need to make it sound cool. Otherwise you're just a failure or something like that. I don't know. Knowing what I did in semi-pro 
in the States is exactly what I'm doing with the clubs here in Europe. The only difference is this part that I, you know, when it comes down to the clubs. Here, they have a promotion demotion system. And over in the States, it was a very static league. And we're gonna erase this stuff and we're gonna use this to describe both those systems. So we'll stick with this one because it's relatively easy, but this is for the Europeans. Whether you're in school, and this goes for high school and college, and the NFL, you have your team in your league. Your team plays in that level of league. In high school, at least in Oregon, there was 1A through 6A. Every state's different because, of course, they are. And in the NCAA, there's Division 1, I, Division 1A, I, Division 2, II, Division 3, NAIA and JUCO. I have yet to see a school promoted or demoted from any of those because it's based around attendance and money of the college and the size of it um, rather than it is any specific performance of the school. But I haven't seen, there was a high school when I was on the process of moving out, Willie and I trained at Mountainside High School. And so they were immediately going to be put in with the other six A teams. And it was a totally new high school that wouldn't have mattered about the attendance, but they were going to be competing with the other 6A teams around the Portland area. So they were a 6A team, even if they only had freshmen the very first year, they would have had a JV 6A team. They didn't have to work their way up. And the same thing with the NFL. You can watch the NFL for decades and you will never, like you... The Los Angeles Rams move to St. Louis and then move back. They are not a different team. They are still the same team. But it's this, they, they have added teams in, but they have never really removed a team per se because of poor performance. You know, the, what they get when the NFL is bonus spots in the draft and they get better clout when recruiting new players. Um, it's just the system that works there. But if you go zero, if you are a, a defeated season, you will never, you will not be out of the NFL. They will not kick you out. And just like you can have a completely defeated season in the NCAA, in the FBS, and yeah, people will be like, but, and you know, you won't get any prize money for winning a cup or a bowl at the end. So you won't get that bonus and probably people are gonna look down upon your college and they're not going to want to attend your college to play your program because you went through defeated. So a lot of colleges can get in like a recruiting slump because if they say lose their star quarterback and a couple receivers to either graduation or going on to the NFL, then suddenly they don't have that sort of system coming in and they could lose the next year. And if they lose that, then people aren't coming in and then they start suffering and suffering but they will never lose their D1 status because it's not about football. It's not about you know track and field. It's not about swimming. It's about the school. There's enough D1 schools that you can kind of play different teams and seem right, but you're never gonna leave that league. You know, you can play exhibition games against maybe a D2 team, I guess. I'm not sure if that's allowed. I haven't really been through the NCAA rules. Over here in Europe, I've rate called this one for sports, merit-based uh, rotation. So actually I was weirdly introduced to this style system with John Green and the soccer team in England that he supports. I forget the name of it right now, it's right here. So, and they've been advancing through the ranks of England soccer, the Premier League or whatever it is. Here for American football, in the Netherlands, we have the AFBN, that is American Football Bon, which just basically means clubs, Nederland. And we have, they call it an Eredivisie and, a, and an Eerste Divisie, and I don't really like that. Um, I explained on my live stream last night what that was all about, but for this purpose, we're going to put Division 1, Division 2. After a fashion, we'll go with a Division 3. In the 2019 season, you ha we had eight teams that were playing. And the Crusaders wound up winning that thing against Lelystad in the end, and they wound up winning the Tulip Bowl. But as it's Division One, you literally just win the national championship. 
there are also eight teams in the second division. I say there's a division three because it looks like it's trying to form. And if we do actually get more teams in the Netherlands, it is possible that this will form up and this will be the startup league. Uh, but right now, there's this nebulous sort of thing down here that you're trying to start up, and when you get enough players, maybe you can get into Division 2. But we don't have enough teams to make a Division 3. We're getting there. So how this worked for the 2019 season is the crew beat Lelystad in the finals and won the Tulip Bowl. They can't get promoted, they just win the national title. However, Utrecht, the Dominators, were actually the, the losers of that season. In the Division 2, Rotterdam, the Trojans, won that division. They got to the point they were, they had become Division 2 champions. And in this system, these two guys played a game against each other. The qualification was, if Utrecht won, they, they kept their position in, in Division 1. If Rotterdam wins, they get promoted to Division 1 and Utrecht goes down. They get relegated down. And this in Germany happens a lot because they have like six levels of American football. And soccer has a butt ton of levels also. And I know rugby, at least in the Netherlands, has at least two, probably three levels. We had a little bit of a hiccup because one of the teams from Division One actually wound up losing a lot of players. And they decided, no, we're not going to deal with this anymore. And they relegated themselves down. So that one, that was, that was Leiden. They chose to go down to Division 2 because they were losing players and things were just a bit funky. But then, then, then Corona hit and everything went to hell and back. So, so Utrecht wound up getting saved that, but they did get relegated down to Division 2. But because Leiden had left, they technically, Utrecht didn't do anything. And so, yeah. Now, the previous year, before I started playing here in the Netherlands, the Crusaders were not actually in the Division I. They were playing a bunch of international games around Europe. So they had their second team, Crew 2, down here, who wound up winning Division Two. But then the crew were basically getting their ass kicked around Europe and decided to come back to just the AFBN. But there was a little bit of a fight um, that Crew won should actually go down to Division 2 and start there because they're coming, they're a new team to the league. But then you got to think that Crew 2 is being promoted into Division 1. So why don't the... Why doesn't the... Yeah, it's, you see what I mean? Like, it doesn't really matter. There's still a crew in the first league and a crew in the second league. So that's how that one says. But over time, you know, if you do poorly, you will move down in ranks. The GFL is another thing. Like I said, they've got one through seven, I think. And there's a team that I had that I was, I first started following and they are in the north part. They were in GFL. Three. I first started following them, and then they won the GFL 3 in the Nord, and they played the team, and they wound up beating them, and they wound up moving to the GFL 2. However, 2019 season came around, because I watched the very end of the 2018 season. So 2019 season came around, and the Elmhorn Fighting Pirates wound up actually winning the GFL 2, and they got promoted into the top league. So I'd watch the, the Elmhorn Fighting Pirates go from 3 to 2 to 1. The problem is Corona hit and a lot of people moved around. A lot of people maybe stopped playing football or they'd heard about that professional league and they wanted to move to like Hamburg and play for the Sea Devils or they were going back home or they didn't have a job anymore so they needed to move somewhere else. So they wound up losing a lot of players and a lot of their sponsors. So they almost basically disbanded as a team and some of their coaching left and they wound up just replacing and having the Elmshorn Fighting Pirates do become their regular team. So now they're down at seven and have to work their way up. Now, assuming perfect seasons, it's going to take them seven seasons to get back up to the GFL one. So that's pretty much how that works. Again, this does not happen in the United States. Like, it doesn't matter how poorly you perform. You're never going to get sent out of the NFL. Nobody gets sent out. Of, 
there has probably been something at some point where someone has been put out of an NCAA division, um, but it doesn't even work that way for semi-pro. There are so many different leagues that they don't have a first and a second division because the strive for individuality and specialness in the United States makes people not have a league with two levels, they have two separate leagues. I prefer this system in Europe because it allows you to strive for something. You do get punished if you, pour, if you perform badly, but teams like the Bengals and the Browns don't really get punished. They get awarded like bonus draft picks and you know early draft picks. The worse you do, the better your draft picks. And it's, it's, it's stupid because it's almost like, well, we're not really going to win anyways. We might as well tank the rest of the season and get good draft picks. Whereas here, you don't really want to tank the whole season because if you can get to the top of GFL 3, even if you don't have a perfect season, but if you can get to the finals of GFL 3, win that, and then go play against the team in the GFL 2 that lost everything and beat them, you get promoted. And that does actually bring more money from the GFL organization. That does bring better sponsors because more people will want to come see your higher level game, whatnot. And you can maybe attract other players and bigger budgets. It's, I don't really know how all that works. I mean, can you imagine if like the Browns sucked so badly that they got kicked, you know, like the Browns got relegated out of the NFL into a, a D league and a team like, I, I don't know, let's just throw out some team I saw, the Midwest Rampage, wound up getting promoted and beat the Browns and wound up getting promoted into the NFL. I think that system would be super cool, but the NFL is this closed little system of capitalism. Getting a little off topic, but that's basically this merit-based rotation, but the USA just plays the same teams over and over and over. Yeah, they got large leagues and can kind of mix it up a little bit, but it's still like the same... You know, it's sort of like you've got pretty much the final four in NFL or in NCAA football. Clemson, Bama, a couple other bullshit things. It's just like the last eight years, I'm just like, this is so boring to watch these same four teams fight for the top control. It's just, anyway, move on to the other. Okay, need a workspace here. All right, so I got a question yesterday while I was out strength training at the sled and stuff. So the question was, how can you show how to inflate your helmet? So my Zenith helmet doesn't actually have the ports to inflate. I just get new pads on the inside. Um, kind of bothers me. It's great that they can't deflate, but I can't modify it in any way. But it's a very, very specific helmet and they bend a little bit more. They don't have huge pads on the inside. They're a bunch of little hex pads that can fold around inside your head. I like the helmet but I can't inflate them and show how most other helmets work. Although I have an NFL replica, which is a Riddell Speed. And I'm not actually gonna inflate it because I don't really wanna ruin the NFL replica and all that stuff. But what you do, this is actually a ball pump. It's a, it's a little long. There's something that's about half that length, which is designed for helmets. And so in the general idea, you look inside the helmet and you see this little thing back here. This corresponds to this part of the helmet. And what you do is, like I said, you take the smaller one because you don't want to puncture all the way through. I mean, just look at how long that needle is. Like it could probably work but you gotta think, that thing is so small on the inside. This one has a couple inflate points, but again, they don't have, they have like plugs inside them. And I probably could pull them out, but again, it's a replica helmet. I don't really wanna mess with it. But what you do, it seems a little stupid, but you wanna like lick this a little bit to get a little seal, and then you insert this inside the helmet. Now the best thing to do is to have somebody do this that knows what they're doing. You can do this yourself, but it's awkward because you wanna get it a good fit. So you wanna be wearing the helmet when you inflate it. So that when you, you know, put the thing in and you and you inflate, you can feel it squeezing your head and go, whoa, that's way too tight. 
rather than like inflate, inflate and not know how to inflate it very well. And you try to put it on and you're just like, <laughs> you're like some Marvel villain is squeezing the hell out of your thoughts. So like these two function for the very top of the head. This pad up front is just a regular pad. It doesn't inflate. And typically your chin jaw pads that go right here are just removable or Velcro or something like that. And so then this whole ring and then this whole ring down here, which is kind of the cradle for your head. This one is inflated through this little hole. It does have a hole and this might be the one that you're actually more interested in inflating because again, what you're looking for with this hole is getting this little area around here. You may not necessarily need to worry about the very top of the head because that's like, you're going to hit here and you know, all that stuff. This is already, this is, like I said, the one up here is just a regular pad. And so it's that. So, but this pump here inflates all of these little bladders for this Riddell speed. Each helmet maker is a little bit different. Again, like my Zenith doesn't inflate, but you can see how there's the two pads. There's the crown and then there's like the ring around the side. And that's, that's how you do that. And you can just use a little pump like this. Uh, you do not want to use like an air compressor. That's just going to inflate this thing and you can pop it and then you got to buy a new bladder and blah. I had a helmet before where the bladder did pop and I had to order a way for it. The top one popped. Um, and it just, it like one day during practice, it felt like I was wearing nothing up there and I was like, oh, ow. But yeah, you just stick this thing in, you know, a little bit. And then for a helmet, you just one or two pumps like that was three but you just do a little bit and you put it on and you keep the pump in there so you don't have to keep pulling it out and then put it on and say oh okay no maybe you know reach around and, and do all that various things that's how you pump up a helmet you might want to have someone that helps to do this like someone with your team like one of your teammates who knows how to do this one um i've helped teammates that are like oh this helmet feels a little loose so i get out not, our ball pump, this is my ball pump, but I get out the pump and I, and I go like, how's that feel? Uh, oh, oh, okay, that's starting to feel. And then I'll like, just a little bit of air and I'll start doing little chunks because this is a helmet. I don't, we don't need it compressing your head. We want it to protect your head and feel natural, but not be like completely loose and bottling around. That's the whole idea behind that one. This one came relatively inflated, but again, it's a replica helmet. I'm not going to be playing with it. So putting it on like that and having it kind of hug my head is nice. If I ever want to wear it for like a party, an American themed party or a Super Bowl party, it's going to be fine. You know, I, I don't have to worry about it being completely loose on my head. I can still turn around. I mean, got that. It's, it moves with me, but it doesn't like, but it's not a good, I also don't have the chin strap strapped in so I can pull it off pretty easily. But as I said, that's how you do that. That's how you inflate your helmet and stuff. Um, there are many other, I'll put a link up there to another guide on how to do it. Um, I don't know what helmet you have. So that's that. I will... Anyways, I need to get about my day. Uh, we'll check you guys on Friday's video. That'll be at a practice, and we will see what's going on. Uh, again, that will be comments, news, and various things. Uh, all the rest of the comments from the rest of the viewers. I just wanted to get that one ready for this video because I had the ability to do it. Um, yes.